Zekah in Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and they drew up in battle array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath, from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield-bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And you, the servants of Saul, choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. I don't know how so many stories in the Bible become children's stories. I mean, there's a few that if you ask kids, they know most of them. They know Adam and Eve. Daniel in the lion's den, and Jonah in the whale, but it's not a whale, it's a fish. It's a technicality. And they know this story. I mean, people that aren't Christians know the story of David and Goliath. I mean, you you hear that in sports. They're like, this is a David and Goliath matchup. And it's just kind of become something that we, we know, but we don't think too much about. But when you really think about this story, it's, it's not a kid's story. It's a rather embarrassing story of adults. It's a story about people that are facing a, a pretty normal challenge. I mean, Israel at this point in their history had been through a bunch of battles. They've had victories and they've had defeats. Saul already had been fighting But yet there was something about this particular battle that caused them great dismay. Instead of everyone slaughtering themselves, the Philistines had an idea. Let's just fight man to man, one versus one. And we'll submit, we'll yield to you if you could beat me. The problem was, this guy was extremely tall and big and armored Nobody was up to the challenge, but you know how the story goes. David comes on the scene not to fight. He's delivering supplies to his family, but he overhears what's going on, and he's interested. He's curious. What's going to happen? What's he doing? What's he saying? What's going to be done for this man that fights him? David demonstrated something very unchildlike. He demonstrated great faith and courage and said in verse 32, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And what makes this story, I think, forever in my mind, a very adult story is because it shows how most of us, talking about men, are unwilling to really do the hard work necessary to succeed at things. Now, we're talking about spiritual stuff. I mean, I think we look out at our society today, I mean, we might very well ask the question, where are the men of this country? And we can look down our noses sometimes at the next generation, but I think when you stand in front of a really daunting challenge that might cost you something, Most of us are unwilling 
to go toe-to-toe with Satan or whatever's needed. And the story really hits at our hearts, Saul's heart, his brother's heart, to see him go out and not only with God's help accomplish this great task, but then win the accolades that Saul would eventually be jealous of and would just drive him mad. It's a compelling story, it's a memorable story, but it dovetails right at the end of our lesson series for the week. If you haven't been here, we've been talking about the church, and we've been talking about God's great plan and purpose for the church, and we spent some time recognizing that things aren't always rosy in our church buildings with our church family, and there are a lot of things that fracture us and cause us problems, but... And if we could think about what a successful church looks like and do some things that might cause growth, we can experience success. We can be successful. But the last lesson, I'm reminded of how I don't really love gospel meetings. Because <laughs> I feel sometimes like, hey, you know, we're going to have this guy come in and be like, hey, this is all you need to do. And, and then you leave and y'all are going to come back next week and be like, well... What do I do now? It's like I'm a timeshare salesman. And it sounds just real great at the time, but then you go home and you're like, I don't think we can use this. And then you're mad for 20 years. I don't want it to be that way. But I, I'm very aware that you're facing a challenge. And it's a challenge that after tonight's lessons are closed and you're thinking about, well, I wonder what's going to happen. Here's what may happen. No one, this is a very real possibility, no one may really do anything different. Now, we may have been fired up for two seconds, but look, life comes at you fast, and you're going to stand toe-to-toe with the reality of things. And let's be honest, it takes work. It takes work to convert one person. It takes work to get somebody to voluntarily drive to your building and want to spend time with you. It's work being hospitable. It's work navigating problems and being a peacemaker. It's a lot of work welcoming visitors and showing interest in somebody you don't know. There's a good chance that no one's going to do anything. But I got good news for you. That one person who's active can make all the difference in the world. That's what we learned tonight so far in 1 Samuel 17. You're going to have a bunch of people on the sidelines. You can have clear outline of the problem. I mean, everybody's on the same page. We need to do this. But only one person stepped out and accomplished anything. And what happened? Everybody won. Everybody won. I want to encourage you to this end tonight, and this is the lesson. i got five slides, five things I'll share with you. But if you, by yourself, are determined, I'm going to do everything I can to help this church, it's going to grow. You mean by myself? Yeah, by yourself. You mean I can make a difference and an impact? Yeah. You mean if everybody else around me is doing nothing? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And you might think, this is wild. How can that happen? And I'm going to tell you, go back to 1 Samuel 17, if you're ever discouraged, and wonder how it happened. Against all odds, David did something that seemed impossible. I mean, the text bears it out. He's twice his height, I'm assuming. Been a warrior from his youth, well-armored, arrogant, prideful. I mean, there's no way David's going to be able to win. But how did David win? It's a slingshot, right? Slingshot's what killed Goliath. No. His faith in God allowed him to succeed. God was the one behind it. I mean, nobody reads the story of Goliath and David and thinks, that's it, slingshots, if only we knew. Everybody got slingshots, we'd win every battle. No, no, it's it's God. And so you can't look at this and say, all right, 
I, I can't undo what's happened. I can't, I can't accomplish these things. And I'm here to tell you, you can't. There's no, I'm not knocking it. You have nice tracks. There's no magic track that you can hand somebody to be like, this has made all the difference. There's no correspondence courses that are just perfect for today. There's no speech I can give you that if you repeat these phrases, people are going to come and go into the baptistry. It doesn't work that way. But God can take you in your imperfection and your youth and inexperience or immaturity, and God can make great things happen. That's what the Bible's all about. And you've got to believe that. And when you see someone that has belief and faith, which leads to obedience, God wins the day. And so all I'm hoping for out of this week is that one person believes these things. Point number one tonight, you are valuable. You, I'm talking about you personally, you are valuable. I commend to you Romans 16 verse 1, our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Sincrea, that you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints. Help her in whatever way she may need from you, for she's been a patron of many and of myself as well. I mentioned earlier in the week, Romans 16, and how great it is to see these people called out by name. And we tend to think of the Bible in broad brush characters. You got Abraham and Moses, you got David and Paul, you got Peter and Jesus. But if you start peeling the pages of your Bible that are stuck together, and you separate the, the pages you might not frequent as much, you're going to be surprised how full of characters the Bible is with people that are just a blip on the radar. They're not mentioned long or often. They're not mentioned much. But when you get the sense of somebody like Phoebe, and we may hear of her in one other place in the Bible, you get the sense that she was doing something that mattered. She mattered to Paul. She mattered to the church. And maybe she was carrying the letter of Romans on behalf of Paul, and that's why Romans 16.1 mentions her first. Maybe he's commending her to the church at Rome because she needed a little recommendation here because they don't know her. Whatever the reason is, though, he took this woman and had glowing things to say about her and basically told the church this, man, whatever help you can give her, do it because that's money well spent. You give her a job to do, you give her some responsibility, you give her some resources, she's going to do great things. She's taking care of me and many other others beside. People love when we go through Romans, you know, they love, is she a deacon? Is she, is she a deaconess? Is that a role? Is there a women's role for being a deacon? And I'll just go ahead and tell you, yeah. There's roles for servants in the kingdom of God. There's roles for people that will put others first. And if you need a badge, I can give it to you. But the reality is that we're all to be Phoebes and Stevens and other people that were willing and able to work and serve the kingdom. And just because your name is mentioned once, or even not at all, the Hebrew writer at the end of Hebrews 11 made the point, look, the time would fail me to talk about all those great people who have sacrificed for the kingdom, experienced horrific things, but experienced great things. But all of those people mattered to God. And in their lives, they made a difference. Look, I'm ashamed sometimes maybe that we don't, we don't do a good job at recognizing and honoring those people. Like we might feel like we matter if someone would tell me that we matter. People, Ann and I have been into this, you know, she's, she's at home with our kids all day, and people are like, hey, does your wife work? And you know, the first couple times I'm like, no, she's at home. And then I got, you know, kind of got corrected a little bit on that. Well, no, she works. She works more than I do. When she goes out of town or wants to spend some time with her friends, it's a disaster. But that's because 
It's the little things that really matter. Like you start missing a meal or your clothes being clean or the house being picked up. You, you start missing all the things that someone does and they just stop doing it. You're going to recognize real quick how important that person is. And let me tell you, I know, I haven't been here, but I know there are some women behind the scenes carrying the day with a lot of things that happen. I just know it because I've seen it. Unheralded, maybe you feel unimportant, but you can make such a difference in the kingdom of God. Let me tell you, 16-year-olds feel like, hey, what, what can I do? What can I offer? You can offer a lot. You can do a lot. You can encourage. You can help. You can bring somebody to Christ. You can bring your friends. You can talk to people about Jesus. No one should despise your youth. You can be an example to other people with your conduct. You can be the kind of person that Paul would look at and say, hey, I want Timothy with me. I mean, that, that's the kind of person you can be. Like, you can be a standout, the beneficiary of your grandparents and your mother passing on that faith to you. Every single member here is valuable in the sight of God. And the scriptures bear that out. And you are equipped to be able to serve in the kingdom. There's not one person in here that God would say, well, I can take you or leave you. You may have one talent, but that's a talent used in service to God. Should be. That's the way God intends it. You're, you're valuable. You've got to believe that, point number one. And point number two, as we're thinking about this lesson then, we need to learn to expect discouragement. Now, discouragement is a very real part of this. I, I'm acknowledging it. I'm trying to pump you up and leave you here thinking, hey, I can accomplish this. I want you to know that any time a spirit of expectation and encouragement rises up, it's like a spirit of discouragement wants to punch him in the face. That's what happens. I mean, go back and read 1 Samuel 17. It's just a long chapter, and we don't want to take the time to read it tonight. But when David said, hey, I'm going to go fight Goliath for everybody, what happened? Did people start clapping? Oh, man, this is great. What a great day. I can't wait to tell my family I was here for the David and Goliath matchup. At every turn, people told him, no, this is not going to work. You're not going to be able to do it. You are ill-equipped to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with this guy. You're unable. His brothers are laughing at him. The king's looking down. I'm like, this is, this is not happening. Do you remember that from that story? I hear this man's trying to accomplish something. And everybody else is saying, nope. And let me tell you, the path to accomplishment is going to go through the valley of discouragement. It's going to happen. I got the passage up here of Paul in, in Acts chapter 20, and he'd been thinking about and talking about needing to take the gospel to Rome. He had dreams in, in Romans of, of going to Spain, but he had some diligence to do in taking some of the money he'd been collecting from the churches in Galatia back to Jerusalem but when he was telling people what was going to happen, people recognized, you're going to face some problems. Remember the next chapter, people are, are going to be saying, look, you're going to be bound hand and foot if you go to Jerusalem. And Paul would continue to say, look, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready to face whatever punishment awaits me at Jerusalem. And it did. But notice what he said in the face of disappointment. I love these verses. I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I don't account my life of any value, nor is precious to myself, only that I may finish my course in the ministry I've received from the Lord Jesus. I mean, listen, it's sad to say, but sometimes change is hard. I'll give you an example. I remember uh, years ago at Mountain View, um, we were singing, and, you know, people had, and y'all have, I think, sometimes supplemental songbooks. That was the thing for a little bit. Supplemental songbooks are tough because, you know, it's just as soon as you get them spiral bound, there's a couple songs you're like, man, I'd love to add that in there. 
So one of our members decided, younger guy, he was young, maybe in early 20s, he's like, you know what we should do? I saw a church and they had the songs overhead. And he brought that up in a men's meeting. You would have thought he wanted to slit somebody's wrist and watch it bleed in the congregation. It's like, this guy was like, what's wrong with the hymnals we got? Well, I don't, I mean, you know, there's nothing wrong with them, but there's other songs. We don't sing all the songs that are already in the book. I'm sitting in this room while all this is going on. Like this person was so antagonistic toward it, and it was like $150, and it was finally like, look, we'll pay for it ourselves out of pocket. You know, this might be helpful. He was so against it that for years I remember looking over, and he would never look up at that screen. He would look down in his book every time. Out of spite. Look, and this is our family. Like, what do you think is going to happen when we stand toe to toe with Satan? So, look, I can fire you up, but I'm just telling you, you're going to face discouragement. And you're going to have these moments where you're going to think, this is not going to work. I'm not going to be able to. This is, a, this is not going to happen here. But let me tell you, I want you to remember what David did. He fought off the discouragement and the people that would weigh him down. And like Paul said, if this is really important, I don't consider my life precious to myself, but my goal is to finish the course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord. Let me tell you what impresses me about the New Testament. How often when people face discouragement and disappointment that they said, I'm glad I was counted worthy to suffer a little bit like Jesus did. Like, let's welcome it. I, I, I want to face it all because I know Jesus went through the same moments of frustration and discouragement. Now, my prayer for you is not to experience any of that. But my life will tell you it's probably not going to happen. So go on and expect it because that's what Satan's going to do to try to stop any growth from happening. You can expect discouragement. Point number three, in spite of that, we need to stay committed. We need to stay committed. What happens oftentimes when there are these moments of discouragement is you'll find out how committed people really are. Second Timothy 4, Paul was feeling this. Do your best, he writes to Timothy, to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Cretans has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him. He's useful to me for the ministry. Paul experienced what it was like when people weren't committed. And I'll just go ahead and tell you, there's very little hope for a church when the people aren't committed to what's happening and what's going on. Now, we don't foster this too much, and I think it's a shame. Um, it's probably a product of America. It's a product of our independence. It's a product of our freedom of choice and how easy it is for us to drive across town whenever there's any hint of a problem. But we don't do a good job of staying committed to things. And when you're not committed, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, you're, you're not going to do anything. Look, if you follow football or basketball... The state of college athletics is not great right now because as soon as I go buy a player's jersey, he's no longer playing on our team. He's gone to find money somewhere else at another school, and then we have to spend time trying to find someone else at another school to give them more money so they'll leave their school and come here. I don't even know who's on the team. And used to, there was some... Hey, you know, I can expect this person. He played here. I don't, am I supposed to like a guy if he used to play here but he plays somewhere else? I don't even know. And we experience this kind of mentality in the church where people are loosely associated with things. It's going to be real hard when there's difficult work needed. I'm reminded of Jesus when he says, look, when you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. And that sounds real mean to say. But Jesus meant it for good. We don't need people who are half in and half out. And too often, people are like, look, all right, 
we're going to go try this out and see if this is any better. And I, I tell people at church, I've had these conversations, I mean, it's like a relationship. If you get to the point in your marriage where you think, hey, I'm just going to try out somebody else and see if this is any better, let me tell you what you're going to find. It is. It is better. You got no problems. You got no history. You haven't had time to have problems. But let me tell you what's going to happen on your second marriage and your third marriage. The same problems that you brought to your first one are going to rear their heads again. Whether it's your lack of communication or your selfishness or whatever it is, like running from it is not going to solve anything. And I would just encourage churches and people that are part of churches to view it as, look, I'm committed to the work. Like I'm here. And if I go chasing the dream every other place and, and somewhere else, all you're doing is pushing problems around and back down the road. And I've seen it. Look, I mean, believe me, I grew up in Birmingham. You leave a church, the people you left are going to end up at the new church with you. And I was like, oh, yeah, we're all back together again down the road. Like, and it's, I don't think, biblically, it's what God had in mind. With a body fractured and fragmented, marked by division. That needs to stop here with people that are deciding that I'm going to be here for better or for worse. We've got to have some commitment to these things in order to achieve anything or success. Point number four, um, and as you start thinking about these things, and I've been talking about, hey, let's have, let, let's have one person make an influence. Man, if you could just even think about what one person could do to just affect one person, th this is really all it takes is somebody that is able to do just a little thing and have such a great ripple effect for the kingdom of God. I love Acts 9 and the story of Dorcas. Peter rose and went with them as they're concerned about this woman that lost her life. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room, and all the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. And it's one of the most touching stories for me, because when you think of like the pinnacle of miracles in the Bible, I mean, resurrection's up there, right? I mean, you could go to Jesus, and you can have your sight healed, and that's amazing. You can go have your, your leg that's been hurting, or an issue of blood, or other things. God can help you. It's phenomenal. But when you say, can you bring this person back from the dead, it's not happening on every page of the Bible. Just a handful. And the times that it did happen, and to whom it happened to, they ought to teach us a lesson. And no surprise to me that a woman and all she's known for is making some kind of afghan or shirt or something for a widow that needed it had caused such a great influence on the church to where they're dragging the most important apostle to see him. And what happens is, I mean, you go read that text. They brought her back alive. He presented her alive. Guys, look at this. And it's not because Peter decided it. Like, it's through the power of God that God said, I want this person back in action for the cause of Christ. And what did she do? She just made some clothes for somebody. We would consider that the most insignificant thing. How often is your, you remember your grandmother giving you a shirt or a sweater no, this is, this is nothing. I could go buy one of these things. But it meant something. It showed kindness and love and thoughtfulness and service. The things that God is looking for in a person. And I'll tell you in the Bible, it's, it's the little things that often matter more than some giant thing. This is the story of the Bible. Is somebody like Ruth just simply going and saying, I'll go glean in the field for my mother-in-law who's lost her family. And so often in the church... I've seen the impact of just one person just doing one thing. There was a lady at our church. She still goes there. She's been shut in more lately than in years past. But she was an alcoholic. She went to AA every week. But let me tell you, there was no more evangelistic person than Elaine. Whew. She'd drag him in from AA. 
And let me tell you, I don't think she was smoothest talker. <laughs> She's kind of rough around the edges, telling people they need Jesus. They knew where they were going. I mean, it was, it was rough. She'd get them there. Let me tell you, we baptized more people from this one woman fumbling and stumbling over some of these people that she knew that I can't help but think she's one of the greatest people there. People have lived and died, baptized, member of the church. They've already gone on to their reward because of this one woman. And all of that can just continue to leave this legacy that other people will remember, but God will remember too. And so I don't know what I need to encourage you to do other than this. Like, just do one thing for one person. You don't have to think, oh, yeah, well, if the church is going to grow, I I can't imagine what it takes to fill a building. Well, just one person. And then one other person. That's all it is. And so you stop and help one person, like Chris was doing Sunday when I was driving up. I was like, is he leaving? Why is he down there on the road? Provide an opportunity for one person. That's all you got to do. What is love to God? Is you have time and opportunity. Do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. So I don't want you to think of the church and these series of lessons in some grand way. It's the little things you do for the one person at a time that will make such a difference for this church over and over. All right, fifth and finally, and then we'll wrap it up. The greatest thing I can tell you is that one person can make such a difference because it will lead to inspiring others. Hebrews 11 is great. I mean, we remember that. The heroes of faith. It's this great role of all the people that have lived and done great things and they accomplish things. And at the end of it, as he turns the page, he explains in chapter 12 what it means to me. Why did all those people do those things? And the Hebrew writer tells us, he did it for me. She did it for me. And they're standing around me today, he said, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses that I can do what they did too. As an example, I can get rid of the problems in my life and the sin that so easily besets me, and I can run with endurance the race that is set before me. And it doesn't take much, does it, to kind of start something bigger than what you've got? I mean, I remember, and I've told you, I've mentioned his name, Todd is over there preaching um, with me over there at Mountain View, and he was such an encouragement to me here as he was preaching at Flint Hill. I remember one time... um, Because Todd did things I'd never imagined you could do as a Christian. I remember we had a guy come to the church one time, and he was homeless, or looked homeless, smelled homeless, and he wanted some money. And Todd was like, all right, we're going to take care of you. Stephen, you want to come come with me? And we did. We went to Walmart, and Todd pulled a cart out and handed this guy this cart. He was like, let's go down every aisle, and you just get what you want. And the guy was looking at him like he's crazy. But, I mean, we took this pretty much homeless person on a shopping spree, drove him back to his trailer he was living in, and we got to the trailers pitch black because he didn't pay for the power. Half the roof was was peeled off like a spam can. You know, pine needles on the floor and whatever, and this guy took his more groceries than he'd had in a long time back into that trailer. Stuff matters to me. I think I saw something then, what it means to care about people and love other people unconditionally, to go above and beyond. I mean, what Jesus would do for me. And let me tell you, that, I mean, that, that helped me try to grow and mature in Christ, and I hope what he did helped me that now I can help other people to kind of grow in Christ and mature and all those sorts of things. That effort's contagious. Like, you might think, well, it's just one person But when someone sees you working hard, pushing hard, doing things, it's going to inspire others to be like, you know, I can do this too. Sometimes all we need is leadership in some of these areas. And you'll inspire others. Have the first potluck, you know, at your house. It doesn't have to be a gospel meeting. Be like, guess what we're doing? We're meeting in my house. I want you all to bring the same things you brought last week. We're going to do Pick up the phone and call somebody that's not been here. 
Like you set up a singing in a nursing home. I don't care what it is. Set up a study. <coughs> Go to a coffee shop. Put a sign up. Do something. And other people are going to be inspired by it. What happened when David finally killed Goliath? <coughs> the Israelites did what they could have done for weeks. They chased the Philistines and routed them. All because one person decided, I'm going to do something. Yeah, I hope this has been some mildly encouraging end to the, the series, only because I know the reality. It's not like everybody's going to do everything. And so you're going to sit here and you're going to say, well, this church isn't all it's cracked up to be. And I've had people come to me with that. There's a couple that came to me at Mountain View years ago, and they said, we just don't connect here. You know, I want you to help us. And I listened to them, and I gave them this. I said, this is what I want you to do. You're not, you're not connected here. I get it. It's not. You're not. So I want you to do for one month, when you come to services, I don't want you to come with this me mentality, and you're thinking like, hey, he doesn't talk to me, she doesn't talk to me. This is what I want you to do. I want you to find three families that you don't talk to and you don't know, and I want you to talk to them and just connect with them. And then the next week, you're going to find three more people that you don't know well, and you're going to sit there after services, and you're going to talk to them, ask them what they do, what they like to do. You're going to talk to you're going to get to know them. And at the end of this month, you're going to have 12 different people that you know more about, and I guarantee you what's going to happen. You're going to walk in the door, and they're going to say, hey, hey, Stephen. When before, you didn't really have a relationship. And you know what they did? Nothing. And they left. I had dinner with them the other day, 10 years later. And they kind of had some of the same problems at the church where they went to. But he's matured a little bit. I'm proud of him. Because he told me, he's like, I think it might be us. I need to do what I need to do. And that's all I'm asking of you, to do what God has asked of you, and to do what you need to do. You can't point a finger at a church and say, this church is what, without indicting yourself. And if you're loving and serving and helping, you're going to be oblivious to any problem that you might have otherwise. Because this is what I tell people. That's how I can talk to one person over here, and he's like, I love this place. This church is awesome. I'm doing great. And I talk to somebody over here, and they're like, oh, I'm so down in the dumps. This church isn't friendly. How can both those things be true? One is serving, and one is not. I've seen it a hundred times. One's engaged, one's positive, one's negative, and sitting by themselves complaining. You're going to create your own reality in the church. And so if you decide, I'm going to make a difference, you will make a difference. And one person can have such an impact on the church. I want that to be you, if nobody else. Thanks for your time this week. Thanks for having me. It has been encouraging for me. It's been good for me to think about, Anna and I to talk about. The lessons are applicable to any church, because we all want things to be better. But when we realize I'm the problem... It's good and bad. I can do something about it if it's me. And the hard part is i got to do something about it. I just encourage you to that end. Thanks for having me. And if you're here tonight and you know your life's not what it needs to be, look, go home and, and change it. Right? If we need to be more fired up about Jesus, we need to help the church, let's go do it. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, well, that's your first step. I mean, you got to be added to the church. And God can do that for you tonight. And we don't want to close the service without giving you that chance through your confession and your belief, your repentance, your baptism, you can be added to the family tonight. So if that's you, why don't you come forward as we...